Welcome to Liberty Station. I'm Bryce Eddy. We are here trying to be a huge threat to the Great Reset. And uh, today I'm excited to have um, a guy on that I already just love dearly because he came to our church uh, not too long ago and preached this fiery sermon. And, uh, you know, I, I think in parts of it, there was not a dry eye in the house. And this guy is just such a blessing. And uh, nobody preaches God's word like a brother. And so uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be talking to John Amonchukwu. And I hope I said that right. You know, he, he's coached me up a couple times, but, uh, you know, I screw things up all the time. Anyway, John, how are you, brother? Hey, thank you, Bryce, so much for bringing me on the show. You did a great job with pronouncing my name. Just listen, man, it took me about... Uh, uh, two years to learn it as well. <laughs> so when I, when I was a kid, I was like, so what did you say, mommy? A-M-A-N-C-H-U-K-W-U. All right. That's, they gave me all the letters, but I thank God for um, the John part, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, man, it's uh, it's it's beautiful. Uh, my It reminds me, my daughter, Angela, you know, as a as a little kid, um, you know, little little baby girl, we uh, we didn't want to have be calling her Angie or you know any of those uh, little abbreviations of it. So we always called her Angela, but she couldn't exactly say it well. So she she shortened her name and gave herself her own nickname, and she and it went from a- uh, Angela to Angina to just Jenna, and she'd say Jenna wants some, <laughs> and it was cute until <laughs> until she That's got nice. it. So yeah, it was pretty cute, but. Anyway, um, uh, man, it means um, I know God. Amen Chukwu means I know God, and so my uh, my father's from Nigeria, but I was born in the states, and so okay. the name has uh, um, a great deal of, of meaning. And I'm glad to know God. I've been a Christian since uh, 19. You know, I got saved early and often. You know, as a child growing up, but it was at the age of 19 where I really dedicated my life to Christ. Oh, I like that. Uh, well, I was a preacher's kid, so yeah, I got saved uh, yeah early and often as well. Um, I'm gonna steal that because that's perfect. <laughs> so, so um, tell just the, for the people that you know didn't see you when you came came here, um, look that sermon up because it was awesome and it's uh, it's on our channel. Um, but uh, but you you had such a great theme of you know ten things you know pastors you know should be saying, um, but they're afraid to say. And uh, I hardly ever take notes, but I was writing those things down as fast as, uh, you know, you were giving them to us. And uh, and I just loved it. But um, it reminded me of one of the greatest experiences I'd ever had in a church. I was in Georgia trying to find my cousin who, uh, you know, came from a, um, you know, pretty uh, up- upheaval of a background and his family was fractured, parents were divorced young and everything. And so he fell in love with this Mormon girl, uh, became Mormon and went on a mission in, in Macon, Georgia. And I... Uh, and I tracked him down, you know, based on this address because I was out there for business and, uh, and you know, got him to, you know, violate all of these rules, took him out for a steak dinner. You know, he's not supposed to go in a, in a car with me. I got his, uh, his uh, you know, buddy with, with him to, you know, do the same, took him out for a fabulous steak dinner and, you know, and, and kind of witnessed uh, to him, you know, over dinner and everything. And, you know, it was just fun. And um, while I was there, I... Uh, had this hankering, and Macon is like this little town. And I I went to a uh, gospel black church. I was the only white boy in the place, and the uh, I, I still can get choked up thinking about it because man, the worship was just off the hook. I've never experienced anything like that in my life, and uh, loved it, man. It's still you know just hands down one of my favorite experiences. And right. You know, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is I, you know, I grew up here in Southern California. Um, you know, I was born in Philadelphia, but I've you know been here since I was a little kid, and I grew up in a way that race was not a thing growing up. Not only did we not have racism, race was just not a thing. And even in my you know public school and private schools and everything growing up. Uh, it, it it wasn't a thing, and that's the only way I can describe it. Is it was like a non-issue, non-event. We didn't, you know, w- you know, we didn't look at somebody, you know, who had different immutable characteristics as us, and it was just like 
something that didn't occur to us. And then over the last, you know, I'm going to say decade especially, it has been the focus of everything and used as a tool to really divide us. Now, I know that people, you know, grew up in other parts of our country and all that stuff, you know, experienced more intimate racism. And I know that there are real, you know, uh, sinful racists out there and, you know, people that have, you know, evil thoughts and ideologies. But I thought we were kind of generally in most areas of the United States kind of over that when I was growing up. So, you know, I wanted to get some of your thoughts on that. And, you know, man, how do we uh, how do we push back against, the, you know, going backwards towards this craziness? Well, here's here's the reality, uh, Bryce. Uh, racism still exists. You know, the Bible tells us, um, I believe it's Romans, Romans 3 and 23, uh, Romans 3 and 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the sin, where it says sin there in the text, it's referencing all manner of sin or all yeah. manner of wicked and evil. It's inclusive of uh, fornication, adultery, um, if you murder someone, lasciviousness, even racism. You know, so um, if that is true in the text there in Romans, it's going, to, it's going to be true today, you know, because racism is not a color. Racism is sin. And so so as long as um, humans inhabit this earth, you're going to racism. Now, what I what I what I say that America is as racist as it once was as it relates to laws. And, you know, when you consider the Jim Crow and how disenfranchised uh definitely definitely not you know but racism still exists today but here's the reality this is what the left this is what the woke group won't admit to that not on, not only can whites be racist but blacks can be racist hispanics can be racist asians can be racist pacific islanders can be racist others can be racist Anyone can be racist and choose to do so because racism is not a color. It's sin. Amen. But what we should be looking to do is to unite as brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. And so we're not looking for avenues to disagree with one another or to uh, shame each other because of our preferences. You know, I think uh, one of the things that happens, you know, if you want to mature in your to cultural communication skills is that you become comfortable with different preferences. People right. do things a different way based upon race and background. And just because one people group does it one way doesn't mean that that way is, you know, inferior, you know, but the problem comes in when people want to put their preferences on a pedestal and say that that should be the normative way of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. And you know, the the funny additional part of this trend lately that I that I'm mystified by is the cultural appropriation idea, right? Because not only are there pr you know preferences and things that are great, but there's preferences and things that you know uh, raise themselves and elevate themselves in the marketplace because they're awesome, right? Um, and and uh, and then you know they have gone on that path like oh no you can't like that or you can't appreciate that or you can't wear that or you can't participate in that because that would be cultural appropriation which is just a, you know a bizarre thought process to me I mean uh, you know the reason here in Southern California we have a lot of Mexican food, food restaurants is because not only are there Mexicans but Mexican food is great <laughs> you know it's some good stuff <laughs> you know um, but. But man, you know, how did we get to that point where, you know, we're going to further divide people based on, oh, you can't participate in, you know, some of our cultural goodness. Right. And the thing is, you know, as, as people of God, we embrace the preferences and, and we embrace the differences as well. Um, I, I think today it's imperative that we take a look at the relationship. Where the Bible says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, God gave us the different nationalities, the different 
pigmentation of our skin. God did that, right? But underneath that layer of skin, we're all the same, right? We all bleed red. And so we should be able to unite. And there was a there's there's a strategy in this country that the left has used for decades. And it's the strategy of keeping blacks in particular trapped in slavery, slavery in their mind in particular, and to keep them from moving forward and to say that their greatest threat today is is not personal accountability. Their greatest threat today is not fatherlessness or abortion, but their greatest threat today is white supremacy. Right. Yeah. Or the white man holding you back from re- realizing your full potential. But that's that, that's a terrible uh, philosophy, because when you look at another minority group, Asian-Americans, right, they are they're doing quite re- well when it comes to having two um, parents in the home, a mother and a father. They're doing quite quite well when it comes to economics. And so uh, we can compare them to the black community and show that many of the things that we contend with today is not because of the white man not doing his job. Oftentimes, the, uh, the, the tragedy in the black family is because the black father didn't do his job. And I, and I yeah. think that we need to own this, the focus there. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Bryce. I've come in contact with some good white brothers and sisters in Christ, right? But I've also come in contact with some bad ones. You know, I've come in contact with some good black brothers, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and sisters in Christ. But I've also uh, come in contact with some bad ones. You know, just because a person is of a certain nationality or race or color or skin tone, that does not make them good. You know, right. there was a time in this country where white equaled pure, right? And black equaled dark and sinister, right? And and, I, and and it's good that we have broken the back of that philosophy and that thought process. You know, I, I know I know black people who would give you the shirt off their back. They've never been incarcerated. They, they wear their belt around their waist. You know, they're gainfully employed, you know, and they're family men and family women, you know, but I also know some who don't espouse to that, you know. And so oftentimes we paint with a um, broad brush to our own demise. I want to share something with you um, from Thomas Sowell. I don't know if you're fami- familiar with him. I love um, Thomas but, Sowell. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's a he, great American. Right. He, he, He's the man. Thomas Sowell, in his uh, in his book, uh, Discrimination and Disparities, um, on page 30, he says, uh, he gives two definitions for discrimination. Okay? Number one, he says, discrimination is the ability to discern differences in the quality of people and things and then act accordingly. I can agree with that definition. You know, because really what I want to show you is that we are discriminate, right? We all uh, have a sense of prejudice and bias, right? We all make a decision based upon exterior factors. We do, you know, Um, and that's, and and, yeah, and that's not always bad. It's not always sinful. You know, sometimes it's, it's discernment um, also being, you know, critical of good elements in cultures and bad elements in cultures and calling that out and being, you know, brave about that, you know, on, on all sides of these issues, you know, is, is, you know, how as humans, I think we, you know, we all improve. Sure. I, I agree with that. You, there are some neighborhoods in North Carolina and Chicago and New York and California that as a black man standing six foot four, 255 pounds, I don't want to go into and these neighborhoods may be predominantly black, you know. I yeah. don't want to go. I don't want to go because they may be um, heavily infested with crime, right, and violence, you know, and gang violence. You know, I remember when I went and spoke before Pastor Jack Hibbs. He told me, "Hey, man, get your gas, you know, near the church, but do not turn off for any other reason, off any other exit for food or gas when you travel back to the airport." And really, yeah. what he was telling me is that there are some areas, you know, even with you being a minority and a rather large minority, there's some communities that you don't want to go into, right? And we should be able to make that level of discrimination against the thing or or region or area, but but not be labeled as being racist for doing so. 
But then yeah. soul gives another definition, which is the the key problem um, at times. Discrimination uh, number two said acting negatively upon personal animosity toward some group. All right. And so you have this predisposed uh, notion of ten about a people group. So therefore you treat all of them the same way prior right. to getting to know that individual. All right. And so I think the, um, the poor form of discrimination is discrimination number two, you know, where you have this animosity towards a people group. Okay. I can't hate you, uh, Bryce, because you're white and because it was white men who used to own uh, slaves, you know, because I can't do that because the reality is uh, there were black, you know, slave owners as well. Yeah. And there were, it, it was Africans who sl who sold the slaves into slavery in the first place, you know? <laughs> and so yeah, nobody, it, it, it's, yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody wants to talk about the, the real history of slavery and the fact that it was ubiquitous all over the globe at the time. And it was actually Western culture, uh, and, you know, built upon Judeo-Christian values that sort of sowed the seeds of slavery's ultimate destruction. And slavery right. still exists today, and I think the numbers, and, and I could be totally uh, wrong on this, so somebody could fact check me, but I think there's 40 million enslaved people today. Now, you know, that it exists all over the world in a bunch of different forms, but, you know, they want to not talk about the fact that, yes, it was both white and black people that were enslaving other people and enslaving like in the case with those black slavers in Africa, you know, they're enslaving their own people and their enemy tribes and, you know, profiting off of it. But that's one of those things that, you know, wants to be conveniently left out. True. You're, you're so right. And people um, intentionally over, overlook that because they don't want to admit to the fact that all people can be racist, right? They yeah. want to label one group and keep... Um, uh, blacks bound on the proverbial plantation, you know, so that they can garner political favor from them and keep them marginalized in a particular party. Um, but you, you, you're, so, you're so right. Um, even when you consider African countries today, the majority of the slavery that still exists is in African countries. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's in Af African continents, you know, and so the, it, it's amazing that people oftentimes overlook that and they don't want to consider it. But that's that that as well is a ploy and a tactic. Yeah. So, um, you know, going back to like, you know, in my youth, um, you know, I went here to, you know, local high school and, and I think it started um in the first part of high school, for me, they started bussing in kids from, you know, the urban environment. And um, at that same time, there was, uh, you know, gangster rap and, um, you know, the glorification of, you know, that, that um, you know, th those cultural... Um, uh, well, we had we had like colors, the movie, and you know Sean Penn back in the day, and you know all, and drive-by shootings were on the news, and all that stuff was going on, and you know they they bus all these kids into you know our little you know suburban high school, and we were we were afraid of them. Which, you know, prior to that, you know, as a kid, you know, I've never, it never occurred to me to be afraid of someone with a different color skin, but our culture started to glorify some of those things that were going on in the inner city that way. And mm -hmm. what was interesting is most of these kids that were being bussed up there, it, they weren't those kids they were most of them were not members of gangs most of them were not part of that but they did at the same time dress like it adopt some of those things that were bubbling up in the culture the gangster rap that was glorifying um you know all those things you know created this now environment of tension you, you know what what ended up happening like in our school especially is you know we all became friends they were you know all these you know we all played on the same sports teams together and so you know generally it was a really positive thing but I remember for the first time in my life having this like, oh, wow, you know, what are they, you know, what are they bringing into our school? And, mm -hmm. and that is a shameful thing, I think, that modern culture did. Um, and then 
furthermore, on top of that, you know, there is this uh, shift, and I think this is all intentional over time by the left and you know the the most extreme elements of the left. Um, but but at that at that same time, they were starting to. Um, you know, I think, I think again, sow those seeds and destroy, you know, black family, right? Because black families, uh, you know, had higher in the uh, prior to the 1960s had higher rates of fathers in the homes than even white communities, and I believe that statistic, um, you know, is 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 true there. And then, and then they just they just started to absolutely destroy and enslave over time the you know the black families by you know getting you know the the black mothers married to the state and you know the black fathers to abdicate their responsibility. So, anyway, I don't know if there was a question in there other than <laughs> comment on that. That is so true. From the early 1900s all the way up to somewhere around the the death of. Uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the black marriage rate did rival that of whites. It did. You know, that is, that, that is a fact. But it was Lyndon B. Johnson who brought in this uh, great society, this new deal, um, where black fathers were removed from the home and replaced $400 check, right, from the government. And what that did was it broke the back of the black community because God's intention and God's plan is that we would have a patriarchal system, all right? Now, that does not negate the significance and the importance of matriarchs, of moms, of mothers, of women. However, God's system is patriarchal. And what they did destroyed the upward mobility of the black community by removing dad from the home. Right. Many women, they, they could they could get benefits from the state if there wasn't a father there living in the home. And so they chose to take the check and dad left home. And today, nearly um, 75 to 80 percent of black homes are only with one parent. Yeah. And you can't survive that. You can't you can't. A people group cannot flourish without the patriarch being in its rightful place. And Amen. if there's anything that we need to tackle in the black community in particular, you know, aside from the, the racism and all the, the, the woke stuff that people want to make the primary and secondary and tertiary factors that we deal with, we need to address fatherlessness. Now, to your point about uh, rap and hip hop music, I despise hip hop with a perfect hatred because of what it does to the young boy and the young, how it puts a uh, chip on their shoulder and makes them feel like they, they need to hate everyone that doesn't look like them and um, especially white people in that. And, you know, and they, they walk around with the, um, the persona of hip hop, which is, you know, tattoos everywhere, you know, all over, all over your face and the earrings and, uh, the pants around your, your, your knees, you know what I mean? Uh, I never understood that um, that system of, of, of putting your, you know, not wearing a belt and having your pants around your knees. So <laughs> you try to run from somebody and you can't run because you got to put one hand on your waist, you know what I mean, to try to pull your pants up, you know, which um, really uh, ha having your pants around your knees really came from jail. You know, it, it really it, it was a, a system that was put in place to show if you was someone else's female dog. Right? Oh, wow. And if you were one that, that was being used, you know, for people to uh, have sex with, you know what I mean? So you would be the person who walk, walked around with your pants hung down, you know. Um, but rap music, consider the words, you know, the beat, you know, is what typically attracts most youth. Right. But you it's powerful. To the, yeah, it's it's powerful, you know, and but listen to the lyrics, you know. I'm a go in the store, and I'm a bang 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 kill a nigga, you know, and and I'm a shoot ten people, and I'm a I'm a go yeah. home and beat my baby mama, and yeah, and you know, and 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 the reality is they're they're able to get women to dance to that as they're calling them hoes and chicken heads and skeezers and things of that nature, you know what I mean? That, that is demonstrative. That is terrible. Well, and what's, what what's sad to support that kind of music? 
Yeah, what's sad about that too is, I mean, so uh, uh, black creative artistry, especially with music, is phenomenal and amazing. I mean, so much of our, the best of our modern culture um, and, you know, our early culture came from, um, you know, that artistic sense. I mean, I think of, you know, some of the most amazing hymns and expressions Mm -hmm. of worship music and, you know, jazz and blues and so many of these things, you know, uh, came directly from, you know, the, the, uh, best parts of, you know, black and African and other, uh, nations, uh, cultures. And, um, they, and so that's why also it's, it is, uh, rap can be alluring, right? Because it does have some of that, you know, those amazing beats and some of those things that are just, you know, so attractive to the soul, and then, you know, it's mixing in, you know, these evil messages um, and, and getting people anesthetized to it. And then that the culture that comes along with that, um, you know, you, you wonder why, um, you know, someone will cross to the other side of the street if you see a guy come and he, he could be the most gentle of people, you know, the most kind of hearted. He could be a Christian going to church, but dressing like, you know, a a gangster adopting that stuff, you know, of course you're going to be, okay, wait, hey, maybe I'll go over here. Um, And uh, and then that ends up being a a sign of, oh, look at that racist, you know, what what they did. Um, And that message somehow has to change. Yeah, it it, it does. And, you know, um, there are counter to the lewd uh, um, lyrics and the culture of rap, you know, because we have the same kind of um, mindset in the rock music, you know? Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. It brings along with it, a, you know, um, in Thomas Sowell's book, um, Black Rednecks and White Liberals, you know, he really, <laughs> he really ex- <laughs> exposes a lot of the issues in, 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 in the South, you know, because the, the Blacks, the, uh, the black rednecks and the white liberals in the South were quite different from the from the blacks and the whites in the North, you right. know. And and much of the hardcore living that you that you see in the South, you know what I mean? In the 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 murder, the the violence, you know, the cruelness, we saw that as well in people who lived in the trailer parks who were white liberals. Yeah. Or, or yeah, you know, Appalachia, and uh, you know, I right. mean, places that are just rocked by you know opioid and you know heroin and meth use, exactly. and yeah, I mean, and and obviously all of that exists, um, right. you know, in various forms, and you know, in all that culture, um, that stuff, I think, you know, we can more honestly talk about. But what sure. the uh, the liberal and left establishments done is make all of the other forms of going, hey, wait, there's an emergency here that needs to be addressed. You know, we got to take care of fatherlessness. We've got to, you know, clean these right. things up. You know, they've, they've, you know, made these issues, uh, you know, divisive and, you know, the, the source of how they collect their own power. You know, let's get all these people to fight and not be united. True. Hey, I, I, I agree with that. There is a political plan behind um, the propaganda the left uses to control black people. Man, I, I, I can say that a million times while we're on here uh, today. And, and, it, and it has worked, you know, by and large, you know, uh, blacks particularly vote for one one party. And it's not until we transition from being um, the majority of the uh, of us being Democrats to becoming independents, at least, and yeah. to listen from the middle. I'm a registered yeah. independent, but but I vote conservative. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, both uh, liberal. Yeah, I was just gonna say both parties have have radically failed us, and you know, and sure. none of these issues are Democrat or Republican issues, really. Um, you know, these are issues of right and wrong. These are issues of. Uh, you know, good and evil that need to be addressed. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I like that you said is, um, uh, pro-life, uh, is not a white evangelical point of view. Um, and one of the things LBJ, who was a racist, there's great evidence of, you know, the amount of racism that, you know, that guy, uh, indulged in, and he was not a, not a good dude, you know, um, 
sowed the seeds of of this destruction with you know the welfare system and you know and some of those things that you mentioned earlier, and then you had Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenicist, setting up Planned right. Parenthoods in um, you know urban and black neighborhoods yeah. because she wanted nothing more than to you know put a break on the flourishing of black uh, culture and the production of black babies. Um, mm-hmm. but, but man, uh, we got to unite on that thing. We have to unite yeah. on pro-life. We, we, we have to, um, Margaret Sanger said this. she said the minister's work is also important and also he should be trained perhaps by the Federation as to our IO that we hope to reach. We do not work. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Yeah, that was, a, words, that was a PR thing there <laughs> that you wrote out. <laughs> that was for internal use only. That's right. <laughs> and so uh, in a letter that she sent to Dr. Clarence C.J. Gamble, as she was trying to move her ideals forward through the Federation. And she wanted to uh, eviscerate, eliminate through eugenics. And she has been successful, you know, um, 900 black babies, black babies a day and counting are aborted every day in this country. You know, when you consider uh, states like New York, there are more black babies aborted than are given birth to. And her plan has worked. You know, um, blacks only represent 13 percent of the overall population in this country. 13 percent. We were we were once the largest minority group, but because values have shifted and we went from, you know, having two parent family homes and and giving birth to five, 10, 15 children, you know, that that kind of culture. Um, Now that we're aborting so many babies, Hispanics are now the largest minority group, right? And they give birth to their children. But blacks are declining because of abortion, okay? Um, And I tell you, the greatest threat to blacks is not a white officer killing us. (laughs) <laughs> you know, the, the greatest threat to a black baby is being in the womb of a black mother. And wow. so it's imperative. That's a dark thought. It, it, it really is. It really is. It's, it's to, uh, to that. And Margaret Sanger has uh, succeeded. And her mission that's now being placed through um, Planned Parenthood has worked. You know, look at the federal government. The federal government, give, government gives... Planned Parenthood over six hundred million dollars a year. All right, um, Bezos, Jeff Bezos, um, former wife uh, Mackenzie Scott, she gave them um, over two hundred and fifty million dollars. Okay, wow. You have uh, Joe Biden come out and say we want to appoint the first uh, f- uh, black female to the Supreme Court. Okay. And if- as he doing that? Well, he's doing that because he needs a voice on the Supreme Court to counter another black voice, which is Clarence Thomas. You know, but you know the the the, the left and and blacks who are um, oblivious to what's uh, going on, they don't want to hear Clarence Thomas. You know, they don't like his values. You know, they like, for some reason or another they are they are against the candidate who wants to or, or the Supreme Court justice or the person who is pro family. You know, so a pro-family politician is is the best person that you want in office, especially if you want your your posterity, your lineage to thrive. Why not put in a candidate that's all about the nuclear family? Why support a BL, a BLM, a Black Lives Matters kind of politician who is against the nuclear family, and who supports? All of these god awful things like uh, transgenderism and this Pride Month that we're in right now, man. Listen, blacks have become the cheap prostitutes of the Democratic Party. Screw us and barely pay us, and we keep coming back for more. And wow. we are being killed, killed at an alarming rate at our local abortion clinics. And listen, I had a black father tell me. 
in 2020, during the height of um, the George Floyd debacle, regardless of how you, whether or not you believe that he was killed because of Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck or fentanyl in his system or for him simply resisting arrest, you know, uh, people are still still have their viewpoints on that. Justice has been, has been served, but there are different thought processes thought processes about how he ultimately died. Okay, um, but I had a black father at one of the largest abortion clinics in the southeast say to me, uh, "Why are you out here fighting a white man's issue?" Wow. He told me, "A white I've been, I've been going to this abortion clinic for the past eight years, right? Trying to save babies, all babies. Of course, I wanted to save black babies. I'm a black man. What what black man wouldn't want to save a black baby?" Right? Yeah. But I had this black father come up to me and say, I'm fighting a white man's issue. On that day, 70 percent of the people who were outside of the clinic trying to save the babies were white, 70 percent. But nearly 80 to 85 percent of the people in the clinic that day prepared to abort their baby was black. But yeah. this black man is going to say to another black man who's trying to save 80 percent of the people who are black. You're going to tell me I'm fighting a white man's issue? Now, if I would have asked him, what does critical race theory mean in that moment? He would probably tell me, I don't know. But he was a poster child for all things critical race theory. Right. Wow. He, he drunk the Kool-Aid. He had bought into the notion that whites are inherently racist and uh, fighting against abortion and calling abortion murder is a wedge issue, right? No, it's not. It's a God issue. It's a, it's a life issue. And it's not until the black community espouses to values that are befitting and becoming of their posterity, thriving and living and realizing this American dream that we're going to stay in the same rut that we're in. You know, like I said earlier, blacks represent 13 percent of the overall population in this country. Black women account for 8 percent of that number and black men account for 5 percent. So you already have a problem there. You know, you have 5 percent of the population male in the black community. 8 percent are female. I mean, wh who are the black women going to get married to? Wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's who's, a... That's a... We, we've, we've aborted so many. So many. And then we have men like Barack Hussein Obama who gets a chance to do something about these issues, and he does nothing. What he does is give more money to Planned Parenthood to kill more Negroes. But he calls the Republican Party and conservatives racist. But he's supporting yeah. the party. He's in the party. He was the spear for all things liberalism, but he pushed abortion wholesale. And then what did he do with marriage? It's Pride Month. Let's talk about it. What did he do with marriage? He overturned and redefined the definition of marriage allowing two men and two women to come together. And I'll be the first to tell you that um, uh, the definition of marriage was defined by God, Genesis 5 and 2. God created them male and female. God's first institution was marriage. It is marriage. That is true. And two men getting married, that is not a marriage. That's a mess. Two women getting married, that, that not a marriage, that's a mess. And what do we see today? We see uh, people prideful and parading down the streets, right? They're preparing, even in my state, in Apex. There's a town not too far from me called Apex, bringing a, bringing a drag queen story time to a festival where children will be at. And we're going to watch these, the, we're going to watch these men in dresses put on pumps, put on high heels, put the lipstick on, you know, and get out there and shake their rum and read to children. And that's supposed to be permissible. And if I speak against it, I'm homophobic. If I have something to say against it, I am a bigot. Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you the same thing that I said uh, at the North Carolina General Assembly back in, I believe it was 20, um, 2016 or so, when we were fighting against HB2, which was a bill that would allow uh, transgenders to go into whatever bathroom they so desired, desired to go into. 
based upon how they felt that morning. You know, a person can wake up, look down between his leg and see a penis, but say, you know what, I want to be a girl today. And so they, and so in our state, you know, you can, depending on what you feel in the moment, you can go into whatever restroom you want to. I said there um, in the General Assembly that if being a homophobic individual or being a, a, a bigot means that I have to, uh, that I'm uh, standing against transgenderism, what labels me as a homophobic and a bigot, I'll be a homophobe and a bigot until the day I die. It's God awful is distasteful, we should not allow perverts to commandeer our restrooms. We should expect the church and the preacher in particular to speak up and have something to say about these two. And to every preacher who might hear this podcast, if in the month of Pride Month, right, if, if in the month of June you have nothing to say about the LGBTQ agenda. We need to check your allegiances. We need to check your pulse. And we need to check your draws because you are wearing mm -hmm. lace. You are a <laughs> coward. And our problem today is that we have too many cowards in the pulpit. That is true. Too many. Too many, too many cowards. God did not call the preacher to be a water boy, but he called him to be a watchman. And That's we right. need to expect for the watchman to say something. You know, the Old Testament talks about dogs that won't bark. You know, speaking of God's uh, preachers and prophets, they have become blind dogs that won't bark. What good is a dog that won't bark, right? Amen. You expect the dog, when trouble comes, right, to say, say something, to bark, roof, roof. Do something, you know, make some noise, scratch, run around, do something. But today our preachers, instead of speaking up against these issues, they say nothing. Instead yep. of being like Elijah, instead of being like John the Baptist, they're more like Joel Osteen. Well, we just love everybody. And, you know, we don't want to be condemning. Uh, we just and so they love us a lie. Because when you look at the agenda of the left with the LGBTQIA plus movement, the plus, they want to also soon introduce pedophilia. You know, if love is love, then a man who's 30 should be able to love a young boy who's eight and have sex with him. Oh, yeah, they're and, already starting to change language and do some things to, to kind of, you know, get, get the terminology to get us to used to, oh, yeah, I guess they were just made that way. I mean, what, you know, um, the, the new term is minor attracted persons. Um, and it's, and it's, a, um, it, it's a, a movement towards that. And what, I, I don't know if you, um, I don't know if you saw it yet, but Matt Walsh just came out with the movie What is a Woman? And it is excellent. Yeah, it's excellent because what he does is he disassembles, you know, their entire house of cards just by asking that one simple question, and uh, um, they they cannot uh, none of this stands up to any rational scrutiny at all, and they cannot articulate their points of view. None of it really works. And so you've got to kind of, number one, like you said, do not be a coward. And these, you know, these pastors cannot be afraid of being called names because that's really right. the only way that they've got to go. Um, they, you, they need to be calling this stuff out. They need to be, uh, you, you also talked, in, and I think we talked, you know, before the show a little bit, the transgenderism issue and the, uh, you know, yes. 72 different genders and all of that sort of stuff. Um, yes. What they are pushing is abuse on children they're pushing yeah, for yeah. mutilation chemical castration all of these sort of things and when you say whoa hold up we're not down with that and we need to protect these kids you know they then call you a bigot they call you a racist you know one of the people online said that they were going to buy a bunch of a bunch of uh, trans pro transgender t-shirts in my name um and you know you can't be bothered you you know they're bullies and they are meaningless and you can just wholesale say no i reject that you know get out of here with your nonsense but we need to call it what it is 
and not let them run from that. Uh, Bryce, you just told me that, you know, they were going to um, print some shirts with you on it and, and talk about how they're going to call you a homophobe and a homophobe yeah. and, and a big for your stance against um, um, transgenderism. You know, I, I would be honored if they did that to me, you know, because at yeah. the end of the day, as Christian believers, we're called to lay down our reputation. We're yeah. called to lay our reputation down at the foot of Christ. And we take up we take up Christ. Uh, righteousness has been imputed into us, right? We take on the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, I'm not concerned about what the enemy has to say about John as it relates to me doing God's work. And so labels Amen. are going to come. People are going to call you all kinds of hateful things. But listen, you know that you're in the faith when persecution comes. You know, the Bible Amen. talks about woe to that individual who know, who everyone speaks well of. Right. Yeah. If, if everyone's speaking well of you, you might be doing something wrong. Amen. You know, it's interesting too. Um, expect spiritual attacks when you're on the right path as well. Because, man, I know that, and, and a lot of the folks, uh, you know, that like have been, you know, working on our show and, you know, that some of the things that have been going on here at our church is, you know, we've continued for the last couple of years to be, you know, speaking boldly and all this stuff. Man, the, the, you know, the slings and arrows and all that stuff that's coming at us, um, you know, is, is real. And so, you know, you know, if, if life is too good and you're just, you know, d doing what you're doing and you aren't experienced attacks, then, you know, perhaps you need to take, uh, take some inventory of, you know, that you're not putting yourself out there and you're not standing up for things that need to be stood up for. Right. I, I agree with that. You know, we call this month, um, well, the, the left calls this month, uh, Pride Month, right? We, at our church, we call it Jesus Pride Month. Right. You know, yeah. um, Proverbs 8 and 13 says pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech. God hates James four and six says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, the question that I have for those who are proud in being a lesbian or gay or bisexual or transgender, the question is, what are you proud of? You know, if the medical field would be honest and give you an appropriate depiction of what takes place and the damage that is done to a man's body when he allows another man to enter into an area where it was intended for it to be an exit and not a place where you enter into, if the medical field were to share the truth about that, People would say to themselves, "No, I'm not proud." You know, keep, let, let's let's keep let's keep in mind homosexual sex, two men together, it reduces their lifespan by more than twenty years. Why are you Why are you proud about damaging the lining of your rectum? What is there? to be proud of when it relates to that. So, uh, many of them who've been in that lifestyle for a long time, they have to insert objects into their body to keep their bowels in place. Now, this might sound, you know, this, this, this might sound too gory. This might, you know, be too, um, too, too much truth at one time, right? Yeah. I think we should, we should have the conversation about what happens to a person's body when they allow themselves to be damaged through homosexual sex. Well, and, and you know, uh, you're right, because the consequences of all kinds of uh, lifestyles, um, yes. and, and not, not just that one, but the, the damages physically, the uh, damages spiritually, mentally, all those things are real, and they get right. you know painted over or glossed over, um, you know, by our modern culture as if there are no consequences yeah. and they aren't real. Right. And yeah, the the physical consequences you know go beyond just you know disease, but right. uh, but they they um, you know it's a yeah it's a it's a bad situation and we need to not be afraid to say those hard things you know and those unpalatable things 
I, I agree with that. You know, when you look at the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, you know, they did they released information um, in 2002 about the impacts of homosexual sex and what it does. Number one, increased incidences of infectious diseases, HIV, AIDS, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, pubic lice, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, so on and so, so forth. And then you see um, increased incidence incidences of uh, eating disorders, obesity, um, anxiety, depression, suicide, and colorectal cancer. These things are greatly increased because of that lifestyle. But major Fortune 500 companies, NFL teams, major league baseball teams, they're forcing their players to put patches on their uniforms. We're putting the six-colored rainbow on everything that we see around us in this month. But when you look at the outcome of sin, you find out that it leads you to a destructive end. And why are we allowing people to own this month and to claim to be proud without telling them the truth about what they're doing? They are damaging their posterity, they're damaging their body, and they're damaging their future. Yeah. Amen. Well, those things need to be said. And, um, man, in the um, last few minutes we have here, um, you know, one of the things that I, I want to keep uh, leaving the audience with, because, you know, we are talking about dark things, and we're talking about things, you know, right now, um, you know, that are going on in our world, and it is in a dark place. Um, you know, the, the republic is suffering, and, uh, you know, the people are suffering, and, you know, we've got all this stuff going on, but I want to leave everybody with hope. And, you know, your your message was so powerful, uh, you know, a few Sundays back, and you're, you, uh, you know, are so encouraging. What can you leave the audience with that would just lift their spirits? Well, you know, um, to a person who's in the world that's not born again, they view the human experience as a horror story, you know, because life is hard. Let's be honest, whether you're a Christian or maybe you're not born again, life can be challenging at times. But to the Christian believer who knows Christ, who has been born again, who has their name written on heaven's roll. This experience down here is not a horror story. It's a drama story. We've read the end of the book, and we know that we have overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. There is hope, but you can't find hope in hopeless things. You can't find hope in hopeless things institutions. Nope, you won't find hope on the left or even on the right. The reality is hope is truly found in Jesus Christ. It's knowing him as your personal savior, because the Bible tells us that the earth shall melt with fervent heat. Everything that we see today, the systems and the institutions, the very things that we work and labor for, our families, our homes, our retirement accounts, our churches, our businesses, these things will melt with fervent heat. But as the song says, what we do for Christ, it will last. And the Bible tells us that, and I, if I be lifted up, speaking of Jesus, I will draw all men unto me. This is the finest hour for the patriot preacher and for the patriot Christian to preach and to teach and to show a dark world the significance of Jesus Christ. And guess what? He's coming back. And the whole Amen. earth shall be. God bless you. Amen. Well, thank you, John, for spending this time with me, man. That was such a blessing. And, uh, you know, I, I'm excited to have you as a friend. And we got to get you back here in studio. <laughs> Let's do it. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, hey, good night, folks. Uh, that was awesome. John is my uh, my new BFF and brother in Christ and uh, love him to death. And we will have him here in studio and, and we're going to have him back at our pulpit soon. And uh, just what an amazing guy. What an uh, uplifting encouragement. And um, thank you again for joining us. All right. Good night.